Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, those who have perhaps joined us for the first time looking at an IFR interview. I'm very happy to have with me today Professor Jeff Beatty, a very distinguished international scholar in the field of psychology who has taught at the University of Manchester. Uh, I've been a visiting professor at the Univer State University of California in Santa Barbara, which I very much <laughs> envy and is currently at uh, Edge Hill University in Ormskirk. He has also been involved in um, various television activities and perhaps we can come to that later. But from this morning's presentation, what really came across to me was the implications of the concept of the divided self. And I immediately thought of um, the, the book of that title by Lane, which uh, I suspect has had perhaps some influence on you, but maybe you'd like to elaborate okay. on that. <laughs> well, I heard Artie Lang talking a number of times, and I was always hugely impressed by the guy. I think he wrote The Divided Self when he was 28 or 29, which is an extraordinary achievement. Brilliant book, and from my point of view, an even better title. And I thought one day I will pinch that title, because it captures exactly what I wanted to say about human beings. We think we know ourselves. We think we have a single uniform concept of self, but actually there's another system operating there, which Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel laureate, calls System 1, an automatic, fast, non-reflective, non-rational system, makes many of our decisions for us. That's why I call my work, it's all about the divided self. Um, what I'm really interested in, in is the implications of these two processes operating simultaneously within human beings. And the way I'm trying to pose the issue is with respect to a couple of the major challenges we face. I don't think anyone who reads the scientific literature couldn't be alarmed by the threat of climate change. And most people wring their hands about the fact that prejudice and inequality and racism still exist today. So why is that? Now, if you ask people, if you go into system two, the logical self, people say, of course I'm not racist, and of course I care about the planet. But what I've been doing over the last few years is developing new ways of measuring how the automatic, unconscious mind responds and unfortunately, it doesn't align itself necessarily with the conscious self. So when it comes to climate change, many people have been socialized to believing that success and status is all to do with high carbon lifestyles. Big cars, foreign holidays, a lot of waste in life, all of those kind of things. And when you measure people's implicit attitudes to the environment, they're not nearly as positive as what they say. When it comes to racism, everyone says that they don't discriminate on the basis of ethnicity or race. But again, the implicit measures suggest that there is a distinct own race bias, which comes out in shortlisting decisions. And I'm interested in exploring this divide itself, exploring what the implications of it, this is, exploring how the two systems interact with each other. Because the extraordinary thing is, if we have this kind of unconscious self making a lot of decisions for us, you know, at some point we have to justify our decisions, and it must be feeding information through. And part of the research that we've been doing over the past few years is looking at higher automatic self guides us to notice certain things about a situation or about a person or about someone's CV to allow this kind of logical, rational self which is being expressed in speech to kind of make a decision that looks right. So to me there's a lot of um, interesting work to be done here. This is, these are, in some sense, I, like everything in psychology, nothing is new. The ideas have been around for a long time. They've been around for a long time before already lying. But this has got a different kind of complexion to it because, as I say, it's about measuring how these systems work, what the function of them is, how they interact. So, you know, as I say, Lang's informed many ideas in psychology over the years. He's had an influence on this one. Great thinker, great man. Uh, but this is taking the kind of notion of the divide itself, I think, in new direction. So really, what you're, unless I'm wrong, what you're seeing is that the contemporary situation that we live in is forcing us to look again at the concept of the divided self and how actually this plays out in the modern world rather than just purely at an academic level. Yeah, I, th I, th I think that's a really good point because the problems we're facing are so monumental, we have to have the best psychological theory mm. to base our interventions on. And, and my argument is that we don't have the right model at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I'm not taking Lang's idea of the divided self as the base for my thinking. No but I'm taking his idea that there is a division in the human mind. Mm -hmm. 
And I think until we recognize that, until we recognize that there are people out there who don't know their own mind, as I jokingly like to say, they don't know their own mind because they haven't got a mind, they've got two, and, and they haven't access to one of them. That's the problem. They simply don't have access to it. And until we recognize that, and in some sense understand the implications of that, I don't think we're going to make the kind of progress that we need to make, either on climate change or on racism. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to note, but nevertheless of relevance and interest, uh, our audience uh, will know now that you have been involved in uh, the Big Brother series, which, alas, I was out of the country and never actually ever saw. But I gather from it that it was, it was controversial and it probed certain areas of the human psyche and uh, human behaviour that uh, have been taboo <laughs> until... Yeah. Well, not quite now, but uh, certainly have not been popular areas. Tell us, could you just yeah. look at your experience well, it, of that? Well, when it started on Channel 4, it was an extraordinary kind of idea. I remember being approached in 2000, so that w which is when it started. It had been done in, in Holland, a kind of low-budget, low-specification kind of programme, with this notion of Big Brother. And my area of expertise was analysing human behaviour, micro-analysing it. And when I, I did my PhD at Cambridge, and then I would bring people into my laboratory and film them and analyse them, they might come in for 10 minutes. And somebody came along and said, look, we're going to have people living in a house for 10 weeks, and you're going to have access to all of this footage which you can analyse. And I thought, well, it's what I do. It would be odd not to be involved. Obviously, you need to be reassured about the ethics and about, about the way that the housemates are going to be looked after, but it's an extraordinary idea. Um, I loved it. Uh, it, it I, I had to analyse in detail how people behaved. It generated a huge surge in applications to do psychology, including to the <laughs> institution <laughs> where I was then working. Uh, enormous interest in it. And, and I think people were, were genuinely surprised that seven, eight, nine million people would watch a show, especially where psychologists were poring over the details of the behaviour. Um, I wrote uh, an academic book in 2003, kind of several years in, and many of the examples I had from that book, which has got a lot of academic citations, very respectable academic book, were taken from Big Brother because, and some of the phenomena I observed, uh, the thi the one thing I work on is mis mismatching speech and gestures when the iconic movements of the hand don't connect to the speech. That came out with a vengeance in Big Brother. People were saying one, things, one thing to someone's face, and their movement seemed to be contradicting it. Mm -hmm. And incredibly, it was quite weird to watch a, a kind of concept like mis gesture speech mismatch to go into the general public. It was like watching a new perspective on body language mm -hmm. being shared by people who became really interested in it. And it seems to me we're, we're a much more lit psychologically literate culture as a result of that. My, my new book, by the way, I'm working on for writing, is called Rethinking Body Language. So it's expanding this idea that hand movement it's not just about social processes. The hand movements reflect the internal workings of the mind. You know, like many psych many philosophers in, in the past have kind of got it wrong when they thought about abstract thinking and speech being one system and the body is something else. The two work together to convey complex ideas. So, so uh, I never regretted Big Brother. I think it's changed now. You know, it's moved to a different station and the, the show's different. But but for those eleven years on Channel Four. It, I know that the executive producers and producers were really interested in teasing out the psychology mm -hmm. element. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much indeed, and um, for your time, for speaking, and for giving us this interview this afternoon. It's my pleasure.